Hey everybody, we're back here on Inside the Ropes and we are joined by one of the most authentic men in pro wrestling, Mr. Eddie Kingston. How you doing? Hey, what's going on? Yeah, I, I've heard that before. I just still don't know what that means, being authentic. It's, I'm just being me. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people struggle with that, but it seems to, does that come easy to you? Just kind of being yourself? Well, I feel like, who else am I going to be? Because like you could say character or whatever, but uh, I guess... If you want to say character, my character is me when I was 17 years old, so it's still me. Just yeah. turned up a thousand notches. Like I heard Stone Cold and Rock say that when I was a teenager in an interview. They're like, oh yeah, my character's a piece of me just turned up yeah. to a thousand. So when I broke in, I was like, why wouldn't I listen to the guys who made, you know, I don't want to say made the most money, but you know, were top of the game. Yeah. I can't. I just can't. I couldn't see you like playing a playing a different guy. Like I couldn't see you playing like you know Steve somebody. Like I just couldn't see it. So it feels uh, like I wanted to. Like you know what I mean. I think uh, I said this in the interview last night. I said uh, I think my generation of guys, all of us wanted to be somewhat like the great Muda in a way, mm -hmm. or uh, be face paint like the Ultimate Warrior and, <laughs> and the Road Warriors. You know. Yeah. So. We all at one point in time wanted to do something like that, you know. So you spent a lot of twenty twenty three in Ring of Honor, you know, yeah. going and and sort of doing that. Can you talk a little bit about how how was that kind of pitched to you and approached to you, and were you game for the sort of challenge of you know because you were kind of one of the only guys from AEW who kind of went to Ring of Honor and kind of made it a real kind of thing. Well, Ring of Honor has always been a place uh, that I wanted to be at when I first broke in. When I first broke in, there was uh, a lot of companies who wanted to be like like ECW, and they decided to take it, uh, no pun intended, they decided to take it a little bit more extreme. And these other companies went, like CZW went ultra-violent. IWA Mid-South was hardcore. There was a lot of different places, that, but they all had hardcore. Some it worked out for, some did it. Uh, Ring of Honor was the only company at the time that was focused on the wrestling aspect of it. And then having my mentor Homicide there, my friend Loki there, my other homeboys like Amazing Red and Xavier and, and the Briscoes being there. Uh, it just made it the place to be. And I always wanted to be there, always wanted to be the champion there and all that. So when the opportunity came up to do it, of course, I jumped on it and I want to you know, build off that legacy that is the Ring of Honor World Championship. And it's a world championship for a reason for guys like Samoa Joe, Homicide, Christopher Daniels, Loki, Xavier, on and on. I know I'm forgetting names, you know, Nigel McGuinness, Brian Danielson, just mm -hmm. uh, there's so many other Jerry Lynn. See, I keep thinking last second guys names, but if I don't say your name, I apologize now, but there's so many great Ring of Honor World Champions and I want to build off that legacy as best I can because a lot of things are out of my control. Yeah. Like one of the sayings we have in the back is, oh, not my show around the boys. You know what I mean? Like we only do what we can and yeah. we do it to our best of our abilities and we do it, we try to do it the right way, you know? And that's what it is with me with the Ring of Honor World title. It's not my show, but I'm going to try to do everything in my power that I have control over to make it uh, to build off that legacy. And the strong open weight championship, New Japan is just starting to build its legacy. Yeah. And I want to be like the Samoa Joe of that. You know what I mean? The way he built the ring of honor world title, the way Loki built that. And I want to be that guy for new Japan strong open weight championship is be that guy where people go, Oh, I got to live up to what Eddie Kingston did. Yeah. Just like we all, the Ring of Honor title, we all say we all got to live up to what others have done. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know it's funny. I mean? because it's almost like ROH, I don't, I don't want to say ROH needed you, but, you know, there's a lot of wrestlers who I'm guessing if they were told, you know, you're going to go from Dynamite, the big show, and you're going to go do the Ring of Honor stuff, there might have been a bit of trepidation about that, but you're somebody who's just went all in on it, and that, I feel like that kind of needed to happen. Yeah, I don't, thank you, but I also feel like people have that, it's just my opinion, and opinions are like assholes. Everyone got one and they all stink. So <laughs> if people don't agree with me, it is what it is. Thank you very much. That's your opinion. I don't care. My opinion and my belief 
is that when you say like downgrade, it's not. To me, you know what I mean? To me, it's not a downgrade because I'm still in the ring. I'm still a world champion. And I'm not going to treat it as a downgrade. If you treat it as a downgrade, then it is. You know, the person, not you in particular, but like yeah. the wrestler, if they treat it like a downgrade, then it is. Yeah. I look at every show that I'm on as the best show in the world because I'm on it. That's a little bit of an ego that I have because I'm going to make it in my power, whatever I can do, I'm going to make it the best show that I can. Just like when I think every wrestler should or do or does do this, they want their match to be match of the night within their power. Yeah. So every promotion I'm in, and I did this on the independents as well, every promotion I'm in, I treat it like it's the biggest and best promotion in the world because I'm on it. And once I do that, people feel that. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Act as if or whatever you want to call it. But once you start labeling things like shows or or promotions as downgrades or whatever, then you're shooting yourself in your in the foot before you even get started. And to me, Ring of Honor is not a downgrade at all. Yeah. You know what I mean? I want it, I want it to be bigger than since I'm the world champion, I want it to be bigger than, you know, Dynamite Rampage or Cole. You know what I mean? Yeah. For but sure. and, and but until then I'm gonna keep trying until I lose that championship. And then I'm gonna be like, all right, what's next? <laughs> I don't want to blow smoke up your ass too much. I know it's not a comfortable place for you. Right? Yeah, it's not. You can tell already. I'm moving. Yeah, already. yeah, yeah. Twitching. Um, yeah. But no, like, so before you went to ROH, I would say for about six months before that, there was this kind of like rumbling and wrestling of why are AEW not doing more of Eddie Kingston? It seemed to be just this kind of thing. Did you feel that, that kind of groundswell from the fans that they, they wanted more for you? Or did that not kind of permeate through to you? No, it didn't get through me because like I'm not on Twitter. Like, I've heard other people tell me that, and I'm just like, look, I'm thankful for it. You know what I mean? I'm very thankful that people are into my work or want to see me do that. Thank you very much. Even the people who don't, I'm like, thank you, because you're watching. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's all I want, is I want people to watch pro wrestling and have fun with it like I did. You know what I mean? That made me want to be in the business, you know? Yeah. But uh, no, I don't pay attention to none of that stuff, because again... Like the saying, it's not my show. I don't have that power. Yeah. And if I drive my, I'm going to drive myself nuts if I try to do things that I have no control over. You know what I mean? And to me, it's all about timing or, you know, in life, life's about timing, but also it's about what the bosses want to do. You know what I mean? And what they feel is right for their, it's their company. You know what I mean? It's, it's, his company, or whatever you want to say, it's it's it, 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 Tony Khan's my boss. Whatever he says that he wants me to do, I would do. If he tells me to fight so and so, I'm going to do that. Yeah. And you know, I thank the fans, but they also have done the same for me personally. I'm just trying to do what's right for pro wrestling, not just AEW. You know what I mean? And I'm trying to do right with what I can control. Well, let's talk about timing a little bit because your start in AEW was kind of amazing when you think about it. You know, we're in COVID and you're doing this outdoor show in New Jersey and yeah. this spirals in. So can you tell this story? Because it's kind of amazing when you think yeah. about how that led to it. Uh, it was ICW and uh, Danny DeMonto uh, runs it. And, you know, it was, the I think, the first independent that I did since the beginning of COVID. So we went out there, you know what I mean? Then the COVID testing, all that stuff. Everything was weird. Everything was new. Uh, I was there with Homicide. And, and Homicide just said, hey, man, you got to make a statement. He goes, you come, we're all coming back from, you know what I mean, the abyss, I guess you could say. We're all coming back from COVID. And it's like, you got to make a statement. And I was like, all right. Well, he went out there, Homicide, and he made his statement, you know, being violent like he is. And then I said, well, how am I going to make a statement? And at the time, I was uh, working for uh, NWA. And I was like, well, uh, I'll call out Nick Aldis. And he was the champion at the time. And I said, I'll call him out. And I'll mention my goal of being NWA world champion and defending it in Japan and all that stuff. And then as I start talking about it, I go, you know what, how about Cody Rhodes? Nothing's going to happen, you know what I mean? But, you know, why not? Let me just throw it out there. So I threw it out there, and it caught traction. 
which was the weirdest thing in the world to me. I was like, what, what's going on? And then I got the phone call and they were like, hey, can you come in and fight Cody? And I said, yeah, how much? Because at the time I was selling my gear to pay for my mortgage. And I was not thinking this was a tryout or a thing that could happen in the future or, you know, like I'm going to get a contract or something. It was like, all right, I'm going there. This is how much I need so I can survive another month. And that was my mentality going into the match was, okay, I'm here. I'm going to beat you up. You know what I mean? I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to beat you up. Then I'm going to hopefully get my check or get my cash that day and, and call it, you know? But things worked out a little differently, I guess you could say. And you kind of mentioned that, you know, Cody, especially that day when you guys had the match, that, you know, even behind, backstage and stuff, like, that whole experience changed your life. And, you yeah. know, how he was... And I thought what was interesting was you talked about being so shocked that he wanted to give you a mic. Yeah, yeah, because, like, like I said, I'm used to... There's not a... There's good people in pro wrestling. Just like in life, there's good people in pro wrestling and there's bad people. I did not know how Cody was going to be. I didn't know if he was going to be like, who's this fat indie guy talking all this trash? I'm going to squash him in two minutes to show what I can do. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But he wasn't about that. He was about, no, go ahead, go out there, talk your, talk your and then let's fight. And I was like, all right, man, let's do it. You know? And... It all started with a conversation over music. They were like, what music do you want to come out to? And I'm like, none. I don't work here. Why would I come out to that? That makes no sense to me. Why would you make a Tron or, uh, or, or, or make a song for me when I not signed to any contract? And that's when Cody got the light bulb. He goes, no, come out with a mic. And I was like, all right, man, I'm going to, but, you know, I'm going to say some stuff, you know? And right. he was like, all right, man, do what you got to do. I said, all right. And, you know, there was <laughs> there was things that I said that wasn't aired. You know what I mean? But Cody ro rolled with it, you know what I mean? And uh, I thank him a lot, you know what I'm saying? And people can say whatever they want to say or or whatever rumors go out, you know what I mean? But to me, he was nothing but a pro with me. So I gave him a lot of credit. And you, you also talked about um, that Brody Lee backstage at that show had kind of spoke to you before you came out. And I mean, again, that interaction is kind of amazing because it's like, it's almost like if you were writing a movie, this yeah. the scene you would put in for like before the baby face goes out to do the big match. Yeah, it was, uh, you know what I mean? I'll add some more to that story because I, I didn't want to say it at the time, but like I was walking to the curtain and I uh, saw Mox and Brody. And this is the first time I saw Mox in 10 years. Like we talked here and there, but not extensive because that's not our thing. We don't talk long over text or <clears throat> hell, we don't even talk over the phone. We're not phone guys. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But, uh, First time I saw him and he was kind of like, oh, hey, what's up? Again, it's been 10 years. He doesn't know if I changed. I don't know what happened with him at WWE. I don't care. You know what I mean? So who knows? He looked a little bit scarred. I don't know. <laughs> but like I said, Brody just came up to me and was like, just in my face, just telling me like, this is not the Eddie Kingston I know. Get pumped up. He could tell I was a little bit nervous. He's like, who cares? Be yourself. And then he started pushing me and I pushed him back hard and he, he almost fell over. He said, okay, okay. <laughs> you know? And then, you know, after the match, I walked back and there was Mox and Brody like this, shaking their heads. And then Mox realized I'm the same me that he met 10 years ago. <laughs> and he was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> how um, how important is your relationship with Mox being on screen and off screen in AEW? Uh, guys like Mox a very rare, a very rare breed of person. Uh, that's why me and him both say some people aren't cut from our cloth. It's not an ego thing. It's not, we think we're better than people. No, we just have the same, you know, a kid from Ohio and a kid from New York, we both have the same morals. People say morals, I say rules for our life and who we want around us. Uh, 
Mox is important because of that. And also he's important because he knows how to make me laugh and keep me calm. You know what I mean? Guys like, there's like Mox and Ortiz are two guys especially that just know, and Homicide, of course, just know how to talk to me and know how to get past whatever I'm feeling that day to get some sense into me. Uh, homicide just does it straight street where he's just, you know what I mean? He talks street stuff and I'm like, okay, I got it. Ortiz, you know, talks to me calmly. You know what I mean? Like he, Ortiz almost talks like my mom, how low key he is talking to me. Mox just laughs at me and goes, what are you doing? You know what I mean? And that's what he gets me with. Cause I'll start going off about something and he'll just start laughing and then be like, all right, you done? Why are you, why are you doing this? Uh, Guys like people like Mox, like I said, are a rare breed, but people like him have really helped me out a lot. And he probably hate that because he's like me. We don't want credit for helping our friends because that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Like when I help out a friend, and you can ask any of them, I don't have a lot, but any people who I consider friends, they'll be like, thank you for something. And I'll be like, for what? That's what I'm supposed to do. You know what I mean? As your friend, oh, thanks for talking to me. What do you mean? Yeah. Who else was I going to talk to that day? You know what I mean? I'm supposed to, we're friends. I'm supposed to help you out. Or, you know what I mean? Like, I bought uh, Ortiz's son Christmas presents again this year. Oh, man, thank you. I go, what do you mean? That's your kid. That's your seed. Like, he's basically my family as well. So why wouldn't I do that? We don't like thank yous for things that should be done. That should be normal normally done you know and that's how me and mox are but he's very important he's important in my life and he's important in my career but more like i said more importantly he's very important in my life and i love how i see a different side of him than everyone else does and it makes me laugh when people are intimidated by him it makes me laugh hey, can, I... you talk to, can, can you talk to john for me no talk to him right, he's right there you know <laughs> Uh, I did want to ask you about, you know, this is just something I've always wanted to ask you about, you know, the, the Revolution 2021 exploding ring match, right? The situation. So when that yeah. happened and, you know, you're doing this like, you're probably going to hate me saying this, but you're doing this like Academy Award performance of this scenario, right? You're not the first person to tell me that. But like, yeah. so you're going for it. You're like Daniel Day-Lewis and this stuff, right? Yeah, yeah. And then like, it, it doesn't go to plan. And I remember asking Cody about it in an interview at the time. And he said, look, you know, I need to take responsibility for that because it didn't work. I'm one of the EVPs, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I'm wondering from your perspective, you're in the ring. Talk to me about how it unfolds that you find out what happened. Oh, what we saw. knew right away. We knew right away. We heard everything. <laughs> and I was just like, <laughs> <laughs> And I just remember telling uh, somebody, I don't know if it was Mox or one of the doctors, I said, I'm going all in on this. I don't care. I don't care. This is what the boss wants. I don't care. I'm going all in on it. And that was it. You know, and then they were like, me and Mox were very confident that we could explain it the next whatever on the next Dynamite. We could explain what happened. And I think yeah. we did a good job of explaining yeah. it. You know what I mean? It may not have satisfied some people, like I said, I took a real life story where I had a panic attack before going to court and I almost passed out. So I just said, you know what? I'm going to put this in there. And like I said in like I said in it, the interview promo whatever you want to call it, I call it giving it my heart. Mm -hmm. Was that, you know, that's what happened. I thought about everything and I just passed out. And I said if people get it, they get it. If they don't, they don't. And that's it. That's the end of it. You know what I mean? And that's the way me and Mox looked at it. They go, once we explain this, that's it. It's over. For us, anyway. We got to move on. Because there's another show. You know what I mean? There's there's Dynamite, and then there's, Di at the time, Dynamite again. The next, <laughs> we were doing two Dynamites in two days because it was during the pandemic. So it was like, we got to go. You know what I mean? We're in Jacksonville for two weeks. We got to. We can't hop on this. You know what I mean? The world keeps moving. So we just have to keep rolling it. Um, 
you know, you did the the Players Tribune piece, which was you know a lot of people found a lot of inspiration from because you were talking about a lot of issues that you've. That's so crazy. It. Yeah, it's just me being me. And just you like that. telling your story, but you said yeah. at one point you said I have no business being here. Yeah. Why? I just I did a lot of dumb things. You know what I mean? Dumb young things, and a lot of it was calculated because I didn't love myself. You know, so, uh, and I wanted to blame other people, you know, for my own actions. You know what I mean? No, well, I did it because of this, and I did it because of that. And it was just, the guy on the shoot was inside. I didn't think I was good enough. You know what I mean? Or inside, I thought I was screwed up anyway. So let me just cut, you know, cut my legs out before I even get running. And, uh, you know, the... the Decisions that I made, you know, in the street was like, I would think to myself, like, who, when I was, uh, you know, in my 20s, who would I fight at the bar that could take me, like, beat me up, you know? And it wasn't because I was suicidal, not at that time. May I had tendencies, but it was more like, eh, let me screw up now before I get too far and really screw up. It was never... Let me get, I know I can do it. You know what I mean? It was, I know I can do it, but I'm going to screw it up. So why even try, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I think uh, Orange Cassidy told me one time, he goes, man, you get so far to a certain spot and you just destroy yourself. And I remember looking at him like, when did you start talking? <laughs> and uh, he was right. I used to do that. I used to get, my indie career, if you look at it, it was like I would get to a certain point, then I would get drunk or drink too much the night before a show, and then be in the drunk tank for 24 hours and miss like a month worth of shows, and then rebuild again and do it again. It was a sick cycle. So when I say I shouldn't be here, I never thought I would break that cycle. You know, I thought, okay, I'm an indie guy. This is it. This is what it's going to be. This is how I'm going to do it, you know? And that's why I love Homicide so much. That's why I call him my mentor. It's because he was the one that was always like, nope, I ain't giving up on you. That's his curse. When he loves you or when mm -hmm. he believes in you, that's his curse. He won't give up on you. Even when people have told him to give up on me, yeah. he didn't do it. You know? So a lot of times when I say, when I mention he's my mentor, he's not even just that. He's just someone who always had my back, that always believed in me even when people who he respected in the business were like, nah, leave Eddie alone. Yeah. You know, so that's what I mean when I'm like, I'm not supposed to be here because I wasn't. I did not plan on it. Uh, my At the time, my demons, which are still there. I, I love when people think I'm, I'm all good. The mental health thing is for life. You know what I mean? This is not yeah. my final form. You know, my final form, I know this is a little dark, but my final form is when I'm in that casket. Because I can't grow anymore, so that's it. You know, that's what I mean when I say that. There's no more growing. There's not another day to be different or deep, but not different, be better. Yeah. You know? So, no, I just, I didn't see myself because I beat myself down. You know, and I still do it here and there. <laughs> you know, and I got to be pulled out of it. You know what I mean? And like you said, how important is Mox? Mox does that for me. Yeah. Mox I, or cheese, you know what I mean? My girl, they they pull me out of that, you yeah. know. Well, it's good. It's good to see where you are now. I did want to say, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite things you've done in AEW was the program with Punk because yeah. when you guys did that first promo, it was like whether you knew anything about you two in the past or not, there was a a realism to it, and I wondered how much of the real feelings that you guys had for each other helped that feel the way that it did. It was everything. Because that whole thing was reality. There's your reality TV. You know what I mean? When uh, AEW started doing their reality TV, I was like, ah, just show me in punk. <laughs> just show what we did on Rampage. There's your reality TV. I don't like him. He don't like me. That's it. You know what I mean? And I don't wish him good. I don't wish him bad. I just don't. I, I'm going to I don't give a f about the guy. Yeah. And that's it. Even when he was part of our locker room, I didn't give a f about him unless I had to fight him. And that's it. Just like he don't care about me. Let's not get it twisted. You know what I mean? I'm not the hard ass here. He don't give a f about me either. You know? 
and that's you, it. Do you think that that? I mean, for you as a wrestler, do you find that when that's there, that you you get you don't give a somebody and they don't give a you? Does that make it better? Like, does that make the yeah. fight better? Yeah, definitely does. Like sometimes I gotta make things up in my head. You know what I mean to get to that point. You know, but I made. I'm not gonna tell you what I made up in my head. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true and if I start saying it, it, it when you put things out in the universe someone's going to think it's true and you're like come on man I even told you it wasn't true <laughs> you know but there's going to be somebody or something because people don't listen anyway people want to hear what they hear a yeah. lot of times you know just like when you're a little kid you don't want to hear what your parents are telling you so you pick up on the good stuff and you're like oh but they said but you said this you're like yeah but all the other things I said before that you know you know, the, one of the other feuds that you've had in AEW that I thought was just tremendous was you and Jericho, because you've got this, like, you know, former indie guy in you who's, like, you know, all Japan, loves Misawa and Kawada and all that, and then yeah. you've got Mr. Sports Entertainer. Yeah. And, I mean, the opposites couldn't be any more opposite. Yeah, it was. And, you know, there's another guy that, that goes with reality. We don't like each other, me and Chris. You know what I mean? Uh Chris looks at me as somebody, this is maybe I'm, maybe he'll say he doesn't, but come on. I know, I know him. He's a bull I know him. He looks at me a guy as a guy who shouldn't be in AEW. You know what I mean? Who was just an indie guy who, who's a, I guess you can use, the, I don't want to use the term Mark because to me, People in the business are the biggest marks of them all because we <laughs> try to make a living out of it. I say maybe a stand. Stand's a better, more degrading word. So he <laughs> thought I was a stand for all that, like you said, all the Japanese stuff, New Japan, All Japan, you know, FMW back in the day, even a promotion he worked for, War. You know what I mean? And so many others. I looked at Chris Jericho as just another old school guy that AEW was fighting against, that AEW, when it started, weren't supposed to have. You know what I mean? Old school guys who want to hold on to something that's already gone or hold on to something that they should be sharing with the younger guys to make the business better. You know, and that was really the crux of it all. Yeah. You know, and no, we don't like each other. And, you know, that's what made that better. Because there was some serious shots in there. You know what I mean? Like, he black and blued my eye. I uh, dropped him on his head. <laughs> there was no mistaking that there was some reality to it. Um, I also want to ask you about, you know, you did the stadium stampede match at Wembley. And, yeah. you know, it's like, again, if you if you read that Players' Tribune piece and you talk about your history and all that, what was it like to be in Wembley Stadium? And it's like 80,000 people to do this match. I I didn't realize it until after the show. So after the show, I went back to my hotel room and I and I just put the show on, not even my match. I just put the show on. And there was a shot of the whole crowd in the beginning of the show. And that's when I hit it hit me. And I went, man, I fought in front of all those people. You know, and I was out there, even though me and Mox at the time weren't getting along, I was there with Mox. You know what I mean? I was there with guys who I've shared the roads with getting $15, $20 for an eight-hour drive. You know what I mean? <laughs> or getting $70 to split amongst eight people. And we're like, what? <laughs> you know? And it was that was a very surreal, special moment. And then people telling me, again, not knowing anything about Wembley, where I fought. I was in the... Uh, I can't even remember this, how bad it is. Someone's going to hate me for this. What was the box, me and Claudio... Oh, yeah. uh, fall it in. The, 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 sky, the sky box. The, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was like something where the, where the queen sits, I think, or something. Yeah, like, I don't she, know, something she like used that. to sit at that at various events. There so. you go. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? But when someone told me that, I went, oh, man. That's even more trippy. You know what I mean? <laughs> that I'm busting up people up there where the queen sits. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm like, this is, that's when I went, this can't be real. And I remember going to sleep that night going, this is the night I wake up and I'm 20 years old again yeah. in my parents' house starting this journey. I know this is it. This is it. I felt like that 
during the G1. And I felt like that after the Wembley show where I was like, yep, this is all fake. I'm going to wake up and everything's just going to be back to what it was back in the day. Obviously, one of your kind of crowning moments in AEW is winning the ROH title in New York. But, you know, the whole thing, you'd worked there for three years. Were you able to enjoy that moment in the way that, you know, people would hope that you would be able to? Uh, again, it took me like a week or so right. to really in- sit down and enjoy it. Because when I'm in the moment, man, I'm in the moment. I'm not thinking about anything. That's why I tell people the most free I am in my life is when I'm in the ring. And because all I'm doing is reacting. You know what I mean? I'm not thinking about bills, ex-girlfriends, or what's going on in my life that day. I'm thinking about the fight, and I'm living in that moment. So there's really no sitting down going, wow. It takes (laughs) me like a week or two to really get there. You know what I mean? And that's another reason why I got rid of Twitter is because I don't like the attention on that. You know what I mean? That's one of many reasons why I got rid of it. But I just don't like the attention because I don't feel like, again, this is the side of me that I have to work on. I don't feel like I deserve it This because I'm doing what I've been wanting to do since I was nine years old. So what's the big deal here? You know what I mean? Again, that's something I got to work on, which is a, a struggle every day. But, you know, I took me about a couple of days, not a week, but like three, four days to just sit down and go, OK, that was cool. You know, you won't ever hear me say that, like, right after something. You know what I mean? Because my I'm so amped up, and I'm still just – I'm Eddie Kingston at that point. You know what I mean? I'm still reacting to things, and it takes me a while to break out of that. So, yeah, no, it was a great moment, and uh, I want to make more, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? And yeah. not just in New York, because I love New York. That's where I'm from. You know what I mean? That's where I was born and raised, but, like, me as a wrestler, I was kind of cut from Philadelphia because that's why I used to always wrestle Pennsylvania in general, but Philadelphia big time. You know what I mean? And I love Chicago because that's where I also cut my teeth. All these places all over the U.S. I've cut my teeth and, you know, being blessed enough to go to Japan. And I love the Japanese culture and I love the Japanese style of wrestling. Just I want to share it with everybody. I want to have moments everywhere. And that I can I just, look back on when I'm like 80 and be, hopefully I make it to 80, knock on wood. Uh-huh. But like then when I'm like that age, I can go, you know what? I did pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I have a couple of last things to ask you. Tony Khan as a boss. Talk to me about what is he like as a boss? Because obviously, you know, publicly we'll get to see various parts of Tony, whether it's at media scrums or uh, on press interviews or whatever. But like, what is he like as a boss? Or on his Twitter when he when he gets pissed off. Or, or on Twitter when he wants to call it. I love it. I'm sorry. I know a lot of people are like, that's so unprofessional. And this, let me tell you something. I'd rather follow a guy that's going to go to war with me than not. You know what I mean? And knowing Tony, is, he will go to war for this company. You know what I mean? Not for one of them, but for his company, he will go to, he will do everything. And people don't have to like it. You know what I mean? But he will go to war for it. And uh, that's one thing I respect about him is that he won't stop, you know, and he, he takes everything personally. Sometimes I would tell him, don't do that. But again, I have more experience than him in, in the wrestling business wise, but that yeah. man has more experience than with business than I do. Yeah. So I'm like, well, he can't be doing too bad. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I just, I just love his passion. I love his fire for it, you know? Like I said, me at nine years old, I wanted to be a pro wrestler. Him at nine years old, he wanted to be a booker and a promoter. So that's the way I look at it. I love his passion. And also with Tony, what you see is what you get. So if you think he's a madman at press conferences or you think he's a madman on Twitter, guess what? He's a madman backstage too. But I love it. I love it because, I don't know, man, I get along with the the mad people, I guess you could say. Yeah. Those are my people. And... A lot of people might not realize that you years ago had a WWE tryout in like 2016. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? What was that experience like for you? Was it somewhere that you felt you wanted to be or would fit in or was it something you kind of felt, well, I've got this opportunity, I need to go for it? Yeah, it was that. You know what I mean? A friend of mine hooked me up with it, you know, because he believed in me. And But I went in there with this attitude. I, <laughs> I didn't really care. I didn't really care. 
You know what I mean? I was like, ah, I'm, they're not looking at me anyway. Because at the time, I believe they were doing the Mae Young classic. So there was a lot more women there than men. And I'm like, oh, I know what this is. So I went in with the I don't give a f- attitude because I didn't. You know, it was whatever. Here I am. Take it or leave it. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? I got a booking this weekend anyway. You know what I mean? I got to make money anyway this weekend. And that's all I did. You know, it was a it was a hard tryout. You know what I mean? A lot of cardio and stuff. And, you know, they tried to break you. And I was just like, eh. I got a $500 payday coming up this week. You know, on Friday. And then I got another 500 Saturday. Then Sunday, I have another five, You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was already just like, this is just for the experience. I had no... I had no desire to be there because I heard horror stories from other people. And it's probably, you know what? Everybody has horror stories about everywhere. You know what I mean? But I just heard stuff from other people who got released or even some people, I'm not going to rat them out, who still work there. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I was just like, ah, let's just have fun with this. Let's see what happens. So I can say I did it. But I had no desire really to go there. My desire was always Japan. Yeah. Oh, and my desire at that point in time was just to leave wrestling better than when I got in. You know what I mean? And I was trying to help guys on the independence and in my own way. They didn't even know I was trying to help them because <laughs> I didn't want people to see that. Because then the people I don't like will be like, hey, Eddie, da da. And I'd be like, get away from me. Uh-huh. You know, I don't like you. Why, why fake it? You know what I mean? Like, some people do that now, and I go, you know I don't like you. So why are you kissing my ass, asking me a question that you're not going to listen to anyway, the answer I'm going to give you? You're not going to like it, so why even bother? But yeah, that was my attitude going into it was, whatever, it's an experience. Does it help? If it helps with my indie booking money, cool. If it doesn't, cool. I'm just going. Yeah. And I think they wanted me to be a coach. And when I heard that, I just, I just said, nah. Because at that time, I felt like I had more to give. And also, B, I couldn't collect a check that I didn't earn in my eyes. I still can't. Like, I would have went in there and I would have been such an asshole to the guys who weren't indie guys at that time. Because I would have been like, you didn't earn it. I would have been a gatekeeper, (laughs) you know? And I just didn't want to do that. You know, I didn't want to be that guy. And I also thought I had more to give. And hopefully I'm showing the world and the wrestling community that I had. And look, I'm still giving. Did you, I mean, this is just random curiosity. When you were doing the trial, did you get to meet Triple H? Was he there? Like, did you? Did no, you... he wasn't there. No, no. he was funny. I'll tell you this funny story, though. A lot of the people there didn't know who I was. And I understand, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I don't take myself too seriously anyway. So it's like, yeah, I get it. But as soon as they saw me say hello to Kevin Owens and he gave me a hug and a couple other people that were there. Next thing you know, the next day, everybody was my friend. And I said, yep, here we go. The wrestling business, folks. Here it is. You know what I mean? (laughs) Oh, now you know who I am. Oh, now you want to be cool with me. I see you. I know who you are. I remember. Check. I'm checking names. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's just part of it. That's just the nature of humanity. Not even... I know everyone wants to say, oh, it's the wrestling business. My man, it's business everywhere. Yeah. Let's not isolate ourselves. Let's let it be known. It's business everywhere like that. You know what I mean? So it just, that kind of stuff makes me laugh. It doesn't yeah. get me mad. It just makes me laugh. And I laugh in people's faces. That gets them mad. <laughs> you know? 